In this segment, we'll ask ourselves what the building blocks of experiments are and get to know the key terminology as we think about designing experiments. But before we do that, let's think about why experiments are done in the first place. There are five reasons for doing experiments. The first is to document behavioral phenomena. Any major phenomena like decision biases or strategies used for making decisions are typically documented by doing a series of experiments over time that converge towards the same conclusion. Second, experiments are often run to develop a theory to explain the phenomena that have been documented as we discussed earlier. Third, we often do experiments to study the effect sizes of different phenomena. For instance, how large is the effect caused by, let's say, something like information framing or presenting something as pennies a day on the final measure of interest, uh, which in this case could be the likelihood that people make a purchase or a donation. A fourth reason for running experiments is to reconcile and test across theories that make conflicting predictions. And finally, we often run experiments to test for the efficacy of what we call in behavioral economics as nudges or behavior changing interventions. So these are five good reasons for why experiments are typically conducted. Every experiment studies the relationship between one variable that we call a cause and its consequence, which is often called an effect. In a nutshell, Every experiment tries to show that a particular cause results in a specific effect. For example, framing a price as pennies a day or framing a request for a contribution as pennies a day results in greater spending or perhaps a greater likelihood of donation. Likewise, in a sunk cost setting, increasing the amount that people prepay for a basketball game ticket increases the likelihood that they will fall prey to the sunk cost effect. In this case, the framing of the price as pennies a day or the dollars that are spent in prepaying for a given ticket are the cause, while the greater spending that occurs as a result or the greater sunk cost effect that occurs as a result will be the effect. Let's focus a minute on the pennies a day. The idea behind the pennies a day research was that taking a particular price and framing that as a pennies a day expense, let's say a dollar a day, increases the likelihood that people will spend on that product or service. Now, why does this happen? John Goldwell's work suggested that when a price is framed as a pennies a day price, it increases the perception of affordability of the product, thereby resulting in greater spending. This intermediate variable between the cause and the effect is often called a mediating variable. So in this case, the cause results in a mediator, which in turn results in the effect of interest, uh, i.e. pennies a day changes the perception of affordability, which itself results in greater spending. Let's go back and think again about the basic cause and effect idea. Again, going back to pennies a day, the research suggested that framing something as pennies a day increases in greater spending. But if you remember, this effect happens only when the pennies a day frame results in a dollar amount that can be compared easily to other expenses that the consumer might make that are in the range of a pennies a day. If in fact the per day expense goes up to, to a certain level, let's say it's $25 or $20, then the pennies a day effect might backfire because now the consumer cannot recall anything else they do that routinely costs them $15 or $20 or $25 a day. In other words, pennies a day will result in greater spending but only for small daily amounts and not when in fact the daily amount or the daily equivalent is large. In the language of experimental design, this third variable is called a moderator variable. A cause results in an effect, and that relationship between cause and effect is changed as a function of the moderator. The moderator, in this case, eliminates the effect, but it could also strengthen or weaken the effect in question. 
Now let's think about some other elements of an experiment. We've talked a little bit earlier about a control condition and a treatment condition. A control condition is one in which there is typically the absence of the cause. In the kinds of experiments that we often run in behavioral economics, a control condition represents a condition where the intervention or the nudge that we are trying to test is absent. Or it typically represents the status quo or the way in which a choice is typically currently being made. In a treatment condition, we often add in the intervention that we are trying to test, or more broadly speaking, we try and add in the factor that we call the cause to see if in fact it changes the effect. Now oftentimes in an experiment, we could have multiple causes or multiple treatments that are employed simultaneously. A condition refers to the collection of specific tasks and stimuli that the experimenter presents to a participant. In a given condition, we might have two or three or perhaps even one factor that has been manipulated by the researcher. Treatments themselves may take the form of many factors. Each factor could have multiple levels. For example, in one of the experiments we saw earlier, price framing is a factor that has simply two levels, an aggregate level or and a pennies a day level. But you could think of many factors that have multiple levels. Think about the sunk cost effect. We could run an experiment in which a ticket that has been purchased for a basketball game has been obtained for free, for $10, for $20, or for $30. In this case, the price that has been prepaid for the ticket is the treatment in question, in fact, the factor that we are studying, but it has four levels, 0, 10, 20, and 30. And finally, there are a number of things we could measure as the effect variable or the outcome variable. In experiments, you could study the effect of a cause on the attitudes or on the strength of preference or on the choices that participants make. In behavioral economics, we typically study the effect only on choices, although some researchers do study effects on attitudes as well as the strength of preference. Now, we've often used the word manipulation in this course. What is a manipulation? It is any aspect of a process or a task that the experimenter changes across experimental groups. When we visited the lab, we heard Julie say that the entire set of experiences that a participant goes through can be potentially manipulated from the way the information is presented, the font in which a text is written, or even the color or temperature or different elements of the background. So any element of the task that is changed by the experimenter across groups is called a manipulation. A couple of other terms to keep in mind when we think about experiments. The first is background variables. What's a background variable? Any set of variables that are given in an experiment and are not manipulated are background variables. Oftentimes, the location at which data has been collected, or the ethnicity of the participants, or the gender, or the education level, all represent background variables that are given in the context of an experiment. We have to make sure that we interpret the experiments in the context of the background of that experimental setting. In, in particular, Care must be taken in order not to generalize too much from a given set of background variables and push the results of the experiment into other conditions of background variables. And in fact, that's why replication of the key experimental results are important. It is important to replicate the, the experiment across different sets of background variables so that the researcher has greater confidence in the results. Randomization refers to the act of allocating participants to different conditions randomly. Why this is important is that it minimizes what is called selection bias or allocation bias. For example, think about doing a field study of consumers that use credit cards versus cash or checks when they make purchases. If you simply observed what's happening in the field, 
you might notice that people that use credit cards spend more than people that use cash or checks. But it could be that people who expect to spend more decide to use credit cards in the first place. And so here what you're seeing is the true cause is the actual level of spending. The effect is the credit card versus cash choice. And if you make the opposite conclusion, if you make the conclusion that the payment mechanism actually changes how much people spend, that would be a confound or what is called a bias as, as, as it happens in the experiment. Likewise, experimenters or research assistants who actually collect the data are typically blinded to the goals of the experiment so that we minimize the chance of any allocation biases, minimize the chance that they tend to allocate participants to certain conditions that they think would push the results as they are expected. Triangulation refers to the use of multiple methods with a view to double check or triple check the results. You could triangulate across many different factors. You could triangulate by changing the dependent measures. For instance, in some cases, participants might choose between uh, options A and B. In a second case, they may indicate the strength of preference or they may indicate the willingness to pay. But across multiple experiments, the use of different dependent measures uh, will strengthen the belief that the experimental results all converge towards the same conclusion. Similarly, one could triangulate by changing methods across experiments, by using multiple sets of background variables, uh, and finally, even by changing the data analysis techniques across different groups of experiments. Triangulating across multiple experiments that all try and test the same basic idea, the same basic cause and effect relationship will increase the confidence in the conclusion that the researcher comes up with.